Hi, this is Lauren Rose from the It Hurts to Mom podcast. Did you know that up to 80% of our physical pain is actually from emotional pain? Don't miss your opportunity to get my new workbook called Exploring How Your Emotions Relate to Your Physical Pain. In it, you'll consider how trauma, trapped emotions, grief, and lack of forgiveness might be contributing to your chronic pain. This is not to say your pain isn't real. Actually, it's the opposite. Your pain, emotional and physical, is very real. It's only to say that there's a significant mind-body connection that most of us don't realize. Get your workbook today for only $7 at ithurtstomom.com under the shop category, because once you determine the connection, you might be surprised at the extent that emotions are contributing to your pain, and then you can start to heal what's trapped inside. And while you're there, don't forget my freebie, 30 Ways to Relieve Pain Without Taking a Pill, ithurtstomom.com. Hi everyone, welcome to the Hurts to Mom podcast. I'm Lauren Rose, and today we're talking to Dr. Isabel Amig, a rheumatologist who recently decided to say no to the status quo on how healthcare has been offered in this country. And she opened up the first direct care rheumatology practice in Colorado. She also hosts the Unabridged MD podcast, where she talks health and mindset. She's passionate about getting her patients to remission so they can live the life they were meant to live, which sounds awesome. Thank you for coming on. And thank you so much for having me. So why don't you tell us just a little bit about yourself so the audience can get to know who you are. Yeah, absolutely. So as you can hear, I'm French. Uh, so I did my uh, medical school and my first residency and first fellowship uh, in France in rheumatology. So I was first in Paris, then I moved to Lyon for my residency and fellowship. Uh, and uh, in the between, I fell in love uh, with an Indian man and he was coming, he's a doctor too, and he was coming to the US. And so I asked him to do a third residency because he had done one in India, he did one in the US. And I was like, now that you're an expert, why don't you come to France? And he's like, nope, <laughs> I've already done two, that's enough. And so I came to the US. At first, I, I just did some research to make sure that I really liked it uh, and that I wasn't moving just for a man. And I really, yeah. really loved the US. I loved how research and clinical uh, background were mixed together. There was a lot more opportunity to do research. And so then I came, I actually did my uh, second residency and second fellowship in New York City. I did my fellowship at Columbia University. I really enjoyed my time there. And then I moved to Denver, Colorado, uh, because I'm a big mountain person. I love rock climbing. I love skiing. I love hiking. I just love nature in general. And although New York City was wonderful, um, I just, I was always getting out every single weekend when I didn't have the kids. Um, and uh, yeah, so I was missing that tremendously. So I moved to, to um, Denver with the family. And uh, I was doing a lot of research and I thought that that's what I was going to do, research and patient care. And I will tell you that, uh, well, no, continuing the story, what happened is that at 40, uh, I got burnt out. And it's, it's, it's a weird name to use burnout in the sense of, I don't think burnt out is when you necessarily have a lot of work. I think burnout is when you don't really see meaning into what you do. And there's a lot of it coming, you know, like in, in the medical community right now, there's a lot of it because, and, and this is what happened because uh, there's a lot of requests that make no sense uh, to the medical community, whether it's a nurse. If you actually look at a nurse when they are working right now uh, on the wards, they only like the time that they have is literally filled at clicking on click, like on check boxes and entering information that have that are useless. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. let's put it that way. They are useless. Why would you ask someone that's 40 if they are afraid of falling? Like this, like mm -hmm. it shouldn't be like this same question for everyone everywhere. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's all due to insurance, right? I mean, there are some good in, in those questions, but not to everyone, not like something like this. Um, and so basically at 40, I got burnt out. And what's interesting is that two weeks later, two weeks after my 40th birthday, I found a huge mast on my breast and oh. it turned out to be stage four breast cancer. So there was metastasis to the liver and to the bone. And so this is where the story becomes really very cool, very interesting, is that I 
I had planned this French trip. So I had planned to go to France uh, because I was so sad and so depressed and so burnt out uh, around my 40th birthday. So I had planned this. And so I was in France when I got the diagnosis and I was surrounded by my family. I was surrounded by my friends and I, I was like, you know, back to my roots. And I basically, for the first time, went to see a naturopath. It's literally the first and only time. I mean, I saw her a couple of times because I thought she was so good. But the naturopath never gave me any naturopathic drugs or anything. What she did is that she listened to me for a full hour or more. I mean, it sounded like there was no time limit, right? So she listened to me. And she tells me, you know, don't see this cancer as an enemy. See it as a friend who's here to teach you something. And once you're going to learn it, then you can, you know, like any good friend, this will go away and you will have learned something. And so what it did is that it shifted my perception of disease or condition. And instead of being super angry at this cancer, like, why would you come here? <laughs> you know, I basically saw it as like, anyway, I'm in this horrible deep hole right now. And that cancer helped me get out of the deep hole. And, you know, a lot of people will tell you when they have cancer that it saved their life and it changed their mm -hmm. life. I mean, it's true. It's really, truly changed my life in ways that are, you know, I, I cannot really share, like, I cannot express how much it shared, like, it, it helped me, um, but it really did help me, and it helped me, like, realize what was important in my life, it helped me, like, choose the like, living versus leaving, um, and it really helped me choose, like, did I want to leave, or did I want to leave, you know, and, um, and I, I chose, I literally remember that moment where I chose because I was so sad before and I regained joy and I regained hope and I regained like, like this realization of what I wanted to my life. Fast forward, I'm in remission, uh, everything is doing well. And so what I'm realizing is that at work, I'm starting to again, slowly see a lot of people burn out around me. And more and more, I'm like starting to realize that even I care and I'm starting to slowly realize that whatever I'm doing has no meaning and that I'm being asked to see more and more patients, but not have connections with the ones mm -hmm. that I already have. And so then you're like, I'm just a number, like literally anyone can replace me, but that's not what healthcare is. Like, that's not what caring is. And after having my own cancer journey, I know how important it is because now I've experienced it on the other side, right? I know that the relationship between your healer and your doctor and you is healing by itself, right? So if you have a doctor that you don't really care about or that doesn't seem to care about you, you're not going to heal the same way. There's a ton of studies that are out there. So it's like all, you know, uh, research and all this. And so after a lot of deliberation, but really thanks to this history of cancer, I was like, I'm done. Like if I don't open this direct care practice, and so I can talk about you uh, about it with you, but I was like, I understand that it's not because of my institution fault, right? Like my institution was a wonderful institution. It wasn't because of them. They were trying their best with the system they had to deal with. And so I was like, I am lucky that I'm alone, right? Like I can open this practice on my own. I don't have a full system. I can stop doing research. If I want to do research, I can do it, you know, um, with other places. And I don't, I don't have this huge system that I need to take care of. And so I'm going to remove myself from the system. I'm going to create something that looks good for my patients and for me. And so we are two months in. Uh, we already have more than 20 patients. And I will tell you, I see the difference already in my patient's life. And in my life as well, right? We are caring for each other. They know I care for them. They tell me when they're not feeling great so that I can act, I can help them act right away so that they can get into remission faster than they have ever been. And I've, I've already got so many, and in two months, it's crazy. <laughs> I already have some patients who are like close to remission in two months, wow. um, which is not something that I was expecting. I always tell my patients, give me six months to a year, right? And now suddenly I'm like, wow, the only reason I was asking them six months to a year is that I knew I could not get to see them before three or four months. And honestly, at the end, 
I would see my patient every seven months and I was so mad. I was like, I want to see my patients more often. So that's what has happened. That's my story. Um, I'm still writing the story. Uh, we are the first mm -hmm. direct care. Uh, so direct care means that you don't take insurance, but you're still working with insurances to get medication, to get the infusion, you know. Um, so you, I'm not saying that we should not have insurance. I just say that insurance should not be in between my patient and I. And mm -hmm. I shouldn't try to get numbers in. Like the goal of health is not to have as many patients as I can. Uh, the goal is to have a certain amount of patients that I care so much about. It's like a family, right? Like some people feel that they can have 10 kids, some other ones, they feel that they can have only one or two. Well, that's totally fine. Like everyone is different. I don't feel like I can have 10 kids because <laughs> the two that I have are <laughs> already a lot. Uh, but I have, you know, I appreciate those who have 10 kids and I'm, I'm always impressed. That's great. You know, I cannot, and that's totally fine. I want to care for my family. So I want to care for my family of patients, but that's, that's pretty much uh, my story. And I would love to talk with you about, you know, what I have learned from this journey in terms of healing, because there's so many techniques that I use for my patients. And as a rheumatologist, we have a lot of patients with pain. And so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm super happy to talk to you about some of those uh, techniques because they are evidence-based, they are rooted in science, but they are super empowering to us patients. And I've really put myself into this um, because we don't need a medication or we don't need people, uh, uh, someone else. So the power is within us, right? So, yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd love for you to, to tell us what you've learned in your medical career about chronic pain. So absolutely. So uh, I can talk to you about chronic pain in rheumatology. Uh, right. What I mean by that is that there is also chronic pain in neurology, right? Like there's, like there's so many uh, ways to have pain. What I would say is that number one, you don't have to live with pain. So that's like super important to realize that you do not have to live with pain and you have to make this commitment to, to yourself of the same question that I had to ask myself when I had this cancer, what is this teaching me? Uh, that is super important because whatever we have in our life, I truly believe it's teaching us something. And when we start fighting and we start trying to understand we are much more in tune with our body than if we are fighting our body. The truth is that we are all different. Our body are amazing. Like, let's put it that way. Like, if we are out there and we have survived so far and we are thriving, you know, uh, it's that our body are functioning and our body are trying their best all of the time. We're always trying their best, right? Even when I had the stage four breast cancer, right? Like, it was trying its best. And so then... We have to just be in this really kind relationship with our body and realize that our body is always trying its best to help us. And pain is a way to tell us that something is not going well, right? Uh, and so we just have to sit down with why do I have this pain? So I will, I will give you an example of this question. So uh, I got a mastectomy because of the breast cancer. <clears throat> so the chemo went very well. The mastectomy actually did not go well at all. And I got complication and I got severe pain. I got severe, like, like infection, severe pain. I actually couldn't move my arm because I started have developing lymphedema, which can be really a problem long-term, right? But then I had this wonderful therapist at the time, like, and, and I still see him, right? Um, who told me, you know, you deserve to be fine. Because what had happened is that I was so shocked myself that the chemo went so well and I had no more cancer. Even when I, I had the mastectomy, I had no more cancer. It was preventive, right? That I couldn't understand, like really, like I could not believe that I had had no complication whatsoever. I couldn't believe of how easy it had been. But this is crazy when you think about it. Like if I had been on the other side, listening to myself, to my thoughts, I would have been like, of course, this has been hard, Isabel. Like, come on, 
you went for stage four, we work, you work your ass off, right? You've been doing like the meditation, the visualization, we talk about this. Why do you think that this was easy? It was not easy. And, uh, but I felt that it was easy. And because of that, uh, I had my mom tell me one thing, and I love my mom, but I had my mom tell me, you're not done yet. It's not over yet. You haven't had the surgery. You haven't had the radiation therapy. And those words kept in my mind as, yeah, there's many options to have, you know, complications. So what did I create? I created a complication for myself. So I did those infections and what, what, you know, this is really interesting. There's always a reason why those things happen. So in my case, I went climbing, rock climbing, literally the moment they removed the drain. I mean, that's not super smart. The, the, so what it is is that the uh, surgeon was like, yeah, you can do whatever you want now, no restriction. But they don't know what climbing means. And the truth is that right after climbing, I had another breast and I was like, I'm pretty sure I should not have a breast right now. It's gone. Like it was basically it had build up fluid. Mm -hmm. And I kept asking the surgeon, are you sure I can climb? Yeah, no problem. But my body was telling me, don't climb, <laughs> like relax, take it easy. And I was not listening. And so then I got this infection, a lot of pain, understanding that chronic pain can make you very angry because you don't know when it's going to go away. So I want, I want all of your listeners to give yourself a lot of kindness because it is painful to have pain and it's, it makes you angry because it's exhausting. Um, and <clears throat> this uh, therapist of mine who's also, I mean, he's sort of acting as a therapist and a coach and a mentor, but he's a doctor. Right. And he told me like, I'm like, you're done. Like, just go get the antibiotics and this cannot stay. Like, this is like, you deserve to be fine. So I got the antibiotics and of course I stopped climbing for a little bit and it healed. And, and I was like, man, I've literally created this complication for myself. So just like, and for me, it was because I was like, I did not like, it's not that I didn't deserve, but like in a way I was like, oh, of course, this has been too easy. Of course, why should it be too easy? What should it be easy like that? Like it shouldn't be that easy. And I created this for myself, which is sad because I could have had this surgery, no problem, <laughs> like, you know, uh, but it's not sad. It's just something that I've learned, right? Like it, you learn always. So that's number one is uh, always learn. Like, is there something that you can learn from the situations you have? Is there something you can learn about your body? Is there something you can learn about uh, like your relationship with your body and your relationship with the word. Uh, so I certainly learned a lot when it came to me, um, and my own conditions. Uh, and then there's a couple of techniques when it comes to pain, uh, that work really well. So you do not have to live with pain is number one. Realizing that de you deserve a life without pain is number one. And that. Removing the pain does not remove your identity is super important because it's like, sometimes you can feel like this is my identity. Why would you remove that? Mm -hmm. You know what? You deserve so much more than an identity with pain. So that's number one. The second thing is realize that there are maybe some conditions that are causing the pain. So in my case, I had an infection right? So that's, that's kind of important to realize that I had an infection and I was doing way too much. Even though the surgeon had said like, no problem, go for it, climb, you know, your heart out. But my body was like, no, that's not what you need. You need a rest. Uh, so, you know, that those were my, like my reasons, uh, but there may be a rheumatologic disorder. I mean, I see patients with ankylosing spondylitis, which is an inflammation of the back very often in my practice and their time from first diagnosis, first symptom, so back pain, to the time of diagnosis is literally around 10 years. 10 mm -hmm. years of back pain without realizing that they had an inflammatory back pain. I give them my treatment, within three months, they have no more pain. And that's important, like realizing, like go and work with a rheumatologist if you have back pain, if you have like joint pain, things like that, right? If it's nerve pain, work with a neurologist that's uh, a neurologist that's uh, used to work with neuropathy because very often the pain can be neuropathic and so on. I think that that's really important sometimes to ask for a second opinion just so that 
you know that what you're doing from the Western medicine, you're really taking care of the underlying cause. Uh, and then there's a couple of techniques because what's happening is pain can just evolve as pain. And there are techniques that you can work with to help you feel better. And uh, some of the ones that I use personally, and it did really help, is meditation. And when you know me, you know that it doesn't come easily <laughs> to me. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a lot of ideas, um, but it's so powerful. It's incredible. And, you know, it's meditation, but if you prefer to pray, pray, just something that grounds you. It's, there's many studies that are showing that that helps with pain. Visualization, either it's visualizing something that goes through the part where you have pain to heal or visualizing yourself healthy, doing the things that you want to do. That actually is super powerful as well. And then, you know, working on everything that could potentially uh, add some pain. So for example, uh, if it's... Um, if you're overweight, working on losing a little bit of the weight, because the, the, it's not the weight per se, actually, it's the fat cells. And so that's really important to realize that if you are super muscular and heavy from muscle, it's totally fine. It's the, it's the inflammation caused by the fat cells that can cause inflammation, that, that can cause pain, that can be dealt with. And I tell my patient not to look at the scale because I find it super stressful, but work on getting a healthier diet and exercising because that really does help. Uh, and I've had some patients with exercise, diet, visualization, meditation that can actually get better without even adding any medication. So th those are like some of the techniques that I've used for myself and I use for my patients. That's awesome. And a couple points on what you've been talking about. Both of these occurred while I was in a four week inpatient pain recovery program in a hospital. Um, one of the big things that people would say helped their pain the most was meditation. Mm -hmm. So you're absolutely right there. I, I work on that. My mind tends to wander because like mm -hmm. you, I've got a lot of thoughts too. So yeah. that's definitely something I'm working on, but I've, I've definitely heard that that helps with chronic pain. And I also love that, that with your, your own, you know, diagnosis of cancer and what you tell your patients is trying to learn something. So while I was in this program, we, and sorry for my listeners, I, I know you've probably heard this story before, but we were doing visualization and we were supposed to visualize our pain and give it a color, give it a texture, give it a shape. So mine was this, this black ball with spikes coming out because it's pain, so it has to hurt. And it had this angry face and we were supposed to talk to it. So I asked my pain, why are you trying to hurt me? And almost immediately, my pain said back to me, I'm not trying to hurt you. I'm trying to tell you something. And that was crazy for me to realize that, you know, that it's not, it's not my, my enemy. Like I had been thinking it was like you said about your cancer. It's not our enemy. It's trying to tell us something is wrong. I think for me, what was wrong is I have a lot of, of, emotions and trauma that I haven't processed that I'm working on. So maybe, you know, doing that will help my pain. Um, it's what I'm hoping, but pain is a communication tool, right? It's trying to tell us something. It's trying to tell everybody something different, I'm sure. Um, cause everybody's got their own story and their own cause for pain. But I just, I just love the idea of, of trying to learn something from whatever our, our diagnosis is. Yeah, that's powerful. It's funny because I had a moment of like this where I talked to my cancer cells and it was very oh, yeah. loving. It was the same. It was very loving. And it's it's really interesting to to hear you say this because they, you, you need so much vulnerability to have this conversation with someone else, right? Like I remember having to say this with other of my colleagues and I was like, they're going to think I'm crazy. Yes. And I have talked to my cancer cell and there was so much love. I mean, they're going to be like, are you kidding me? <laughs> like, you know, yeah. and imagine if you were to say this to some doctors and they'd be like, what are you doing? Like, you know, yeah. and I hear you, I hear you. I think, I think we don't take the time. We, we often take a lot of distractions and our ego, it's all about our ego, right? Like our ego is here to help us, but ultimately it's not allowing us to listen 
And I think listening is so important. Realizing that we're not unlucky. We might be lucky to have pain so that we can stop, right? Like, and we can say no to whatever, maybe something in our life that we don't want to do. Uh, that actually we say we want, but maybe we do not want to do, or maybe like it's not in our higher good and so on. So, you know, this is fascinating to me to hear this. Yeah, it, it makes me, I, I think it makes me sound crazy that <laughs> I've talked talk to my, my pain and it's talked back to me, but it, I mean, that's what happened in my brain. So. Yeah, no, I don't think it's crazy at all. And I, I, I well, first of all, because I experienced it. <laughs> so I hear right. you. Um, I wrote about I, I'm, you know, I'm I wrote about it. I haven't published it, but I wrote about it. And it was, I mean, I think I am who I am now because I had this conversation with it. Mm. And it has changed my way of practicing medicine. Because instead of staying to patients look, I have the power to make you feel better. I tell mm -hmm. them, you have the power within you to get better. And I'm just here to help your body. That's literally my job is to help you. My job is to help your body. And in fact, your job is to listen to what your body needs. Uh, and it's so nice. Like instead of being in this fighting mode and, and also, you know, and you probably have experienced this with other doctors, right? Some doctors feel like they have failed if the medication doesn't work to a patient. And you're like, no, we're just trying our best to help the body of that patient. Like, right? Like it's, it's, a, it's a journey. It's a journey and you're going to have ups and downs. And that journey there is not linear. And we're going to try our best and, and we need to listen to our patients the same way that, you know, you like as a patient, we need to listen to our body and to our conditions. I think the doctor has to listen to our patients because by listening to our patients, we're able to make our patients talk and put words on their, on their, these ease. Mm -hmm. and that's super powerful when they're like, oh, I didn't think of that. So a lot of doctors don't really focus on getting patients into remission. They focus on getting medications and maybe relieving some of the symptoms. And some doctors, and I've had a few, don't really seem to care about the patient. Do you think it's the healthcare system? Yeah. Gosh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, it's funny. It's like my, was it last, my last podcast or one, like the one before I literally created a podcast just for that. Like how, you know, how to make sure that you come out of a patient, uh, a physician's uh, office visit with hope. I really think that that's the case. I think that if you actually start looking, the docs that are still in the system, they want to get out of the room as fast as possible because they know that they have to write their notes. They know that they have to order their labs, uh, order their medication, that they have to respond to other patients' uh, requests on uh, their, like, you know, they have tasks. Then they have to respond to whatever, like a training that they have to do with your, their, for their institution. It's become awful. Like it's become awful. It's it just it has removed the pleasure of practicing medicine. This institution, the institutions, uh, and and I think that that's exactly what's happening. Because if you really talk deeply to docs, they loved. They all loved being doctors until mm -hmm. until it just like it like somehow something that's not human, it's a system, right? There's no face to it, has removed the pleasure of practicing. And so, I, I, you know, I, I'm not saying it because I, I'm not saying it because I'm like, hey, you know, come and check out direct care. That's not this. But when I realized that personally, because of my history of cancer, because I really touched death very close, I'm very committed to live a life of like my life has intentions. Like I'm, I'm, I'm in an intentional life. So it's not about the ego. It's not about like, oh, I want to have my paper first in this paper. I, uh, I want to have um, uh, my name first in this paper. I don't want to, you know, it's, it's not about like where I work. It's not about like how, you know, I look, I don't care anymore. Like that's the ego. Like when I was afraid of dying, my ego was gone. Right. Like, and then you realize that, no, I love being a doctor. 
I love being a doctor because I love the relationship I have with my patients. And it's not about the paper that I'm going to publish and so on. And so realizing that, uh, I started looking at direct care and that's when I started realizing, oh, there are doctors that have decided that they are going to do medicine on their own terms. And I will tell you, the people who are doing direct care, they are thriving, their patients are thriving. And it's super sad to say that this is how it is because, I mean, if you think about it, the American system is awful in terms of healthcare. You pay once when you pay your insurance, right? Mm -hmm. Two, you pay your taxes, which means that, you know, that pays Medicare and Medicaid. Three, you pay your copay. And now I'm about to ask you to pay for direct care. But at the end of the day, you deserve it. You, like, I think we deserve the best care there is. So personally, like my oncologist, <laughs> is about to be burned out. I can feel it. I can see it. It was new, you know? And I'm like, okay, I'm ready to look for direct care oncologist if needed be. Uh, because I, I don't want to be, I don't want to be managed by a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant. Not that I have anything against them, but I know the training that doctors have versus that training. And to me, I deserve the best. I deserve a doc. <laughs> and so I deserve someone that specialized in this, right? Like, I, I can't imagine, the, I mean, I know my nurse practitioner in rheumatology, like they're okay, but they don't have the training that a rheumatologist has. It's not the same care. The truth is that they listen better because that's where they're very good at, but that's not, that's not the same. You need a doc that listens to you. You need the, you know, the, the, the perfect thing. You need the, uh, how do you call that? <laughs> like, you know, the whole thing, you need a doc you need a dog. I mean, there's no reason to have dogs out there and not use them. And you need a dog that has the energy to listen. And to come to uh, what you were describing, I will tell you, I want my patients to be in remission. Like it's my number one goal. I want my patients to be in remission because I want my patient to not have to need me. Why? Right. Because I want them to have a normal life. I know that they are thinking of me when they are doing all of their things, you know, like their success is my success. I mean, it's their success really, but it's like, I feel like, you know, like my, it's, <laughs> it's like, I'm feeling proud for them because they are mm -hmm. part of my family. And I feel very proud for my family when they are successful. So when they are successful, I feel the best that I can. And I really want them to be in remission. Um, I think that there are some doctors that are completely burnt out and they don't even know that they are burnt out. And, and the thing is that some of them, because I was one of them, right? I was doing research and I was trying to get away from my patient as fast as possible. It was ridiculous. And the only reason I was doing research, I mean, it's not the only reason, but one of the big reasons I was doing research is that I wanted to get out of medical care because it was too much. And then when I had the cancer, I was able to decrease to the level I wanted, right? Because I could have gone on FMLA and all this. And I did get on, you know, this part-time FMLA. And then seeing patients three hours a day actually fulfilled me. Mm. I loved it. So I think that doctors actually, if you really look behind, they love being doctors. It's just that the system has removed their pleasure of doing doctoring. Yeah, I have several specialist doctors because I've got multiple things going on. My neurologist is really good about listening to me, but generally the other doctors want to get out of there as fast as possible. And the only doctor who really sits and listens and, and tells me that my body has the power to heal itself is my functional medicine doctor yeah. who mm -hmm. doesn't take any insurance yeah. and does more natural stuff. She's the only person with that philosophy that my body can heal itself and that yeah. I have the pa power. And she's the only one that seems to want me to not need her in the, yeah. in the future. Yeah. So I definitely see a difference in how doctors in the system work versus a doctor outside of the system. It's completely different. Yeah. That's, yeah, this, this is, um, it's a time, it's, it's a time constraint when it comes to uh, the docs that are in the system. And it's super sad. It's super sad, but you have to realize that their work 
is so hard. They have to see the patients because there is a lot of demand. What's happening is that they have very often now, they have nurse practitioner, physician assistant and all this, but those nurse practitioner, physician assistant and so on, they don't know everything. And so they either see the other patients that are easy. So then what happens is that the doc only has a complicated one. Mm -hmm. So they don't have any respite. And when the nurse practitioner or PAs have a complicated case, they still go and ask the doc for help. So then the doc has like double, you know, double work. They have to work with their own patients and then they have to help this out. <laughs> and it's, it's not, it's not sustainable. I, I'm, you know, I open this practice. I hope I'm going to make it. I'm, I'm already, you know, I'm already very happy with where it's at. I'm telling you, I think this is the future of medicine. And mm -hmm. my, my team is sometimes worried because some people are like, oh, you don't take insurance, so buy, you know, like, we're not going to be able to, I'm not even that expensive, but like, they're like, I'm, we're not going to be able to make this. Okay, fine. I'm telling my, my nurses, I'm like, wait six months, they will come because they will realize that the docs that I have to deal with are not available. Even if they are in the room with them, they are not available. And I know it because I was one of them and I wanted to do the best that I could for my patients, but I was going, I was getting crazy, like not being able to see my patients unless I, I overbooked them. And after a while, you're like, I'm spending five minutes with my patients. Of course, you're not. Like, I've had uh, some of my colleagues say, I don't even ask them how they're doing. I'm afraid that they might talk. <laughs> like, like, this is crazy. Like, this is not what we went into medicine for. And so I'm going to tell you this one thing. When I say that I'm direct care to my colleagues, every single one of them says, congratulations, this is the way to do it. How do you do it? Tell us how it's working. I want to do it too. Oh, wow. Yeah, this is, I mean, it's a way out of the system so that we can actually practice. I, I'm telling you really seriously, you cannot ask someone that's burnt out to give you energy. They have none. Mm -hmm. And so all of those dogs that you're mentioning, they have no energy. They are trying to make sure that they are, they are doing the bare minimum of what they can do, but they really can't do much more. Take those dogs, put them in a, in a direct care setup, and maybe they have to heal a little bit in between, right? <laughs> but they will offer you the best. I, I really think that every doctor has the ability to offer the best. It's just, it's, uh, it's hard. It's really hard right now. So yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sending them a lot of love. I will tell you that. I'm yeah. sending a lot of love to my colleagues who may not have the guts or the courage or, or are still thinking, you know, or maybe their ego is higher than mine was and they are still wanting to be in a, you know, they, like doctors don't like to say that they failed something. So they may are like, <laughs> it takes a lot of courage to move, um, to move on. Yeah. Yeah. And it's completely different. So yeah, I, I can imagine how hard, what a hard decision that would be to get out of the system into something completely new that you don't fully understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I guess, um, where can we get more information about, about you and about what you do? Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for asking this question, uh, because I'm so passionate about this. So, yeah. um, <laughs> yeah. So my, my website is onabridgedmd.com. It's, um, I chose the word unabridged because I felt that in the system, the way we were, it felt very much, um, it felt that I was only giving a part of me. And I was like, I want mm -hmm. people to have the whole expectation when it comes to doctoring, like the whole me. And I also want to see the whole of the, the, the patient. So that when they come, they don't feel like they have to edit themselves and only share bits of them. They can share their whole self so that we can heal the whole thing. So it's on a bridge for non-edited. So on a bridge MD. And so we have, uh, I started with the rheumatology practice, but I'm really hoping that I'm going to be able to bring energy healing, acupuncture, qigong, yoga, etc., into the practice, uh, massages and so on and, and coaching. Uh, I have a podcast called Unabridged MD. 
And uh, so you can find it on any sort of podcast uh, platform and on YouTube on Average MD. I'm also on Twitter, Instagram, all of the usual social platform at on Average MD. And if you are looking for a rheumatologist in the Colorado area, but also via telehealth for Wisconsin, Michigan, and I'm about to create for more. I'm about to increase because the Midwestern, there's not enough rheumatologists, so I wanna offer mm -hmm. my services. We are currently open to new patients. I'm expecting by the end of the year, we may not uh, open for more patients because the goal is to offer the best care ever for the patients that we have. Uh, but yeah, check us out. We are, we are currently having new patients. Uh, the, the price is very reasonable. Um, and uh, it's at, uh, you can actually email us at info at onabridgedmd.com. So info at onabridgedmd.com. And we'll be happy to have you on my schedule, even for, um, you know, just uh, saying hi type of uh, call. That's awesome. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing your, your knowledge about this subject. It's been a pleasure, really. Thank you so much. I love what you do, and I'm so grateful that there are that you are here in the community sharing your knowledge and getting guests on the on board. So thank you so so much. No, thank you. And make sure to subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss any health parenting or life advice. For my freebie 30 ways to relieve pain without taking a pill, go to it hurts to mom.com slash tip.